Hi everyone, Dom Famulara back here again. The artist series at a distance. This brings me into all new territory when I do each of these interviews. And today, someone who I've known pretty much all of her life, and I've had the chance to deal with her dad in many occasions, the great Liberty DeVito. Would you please welcome his daughter, Tori DeVito? Hi, Dom. This is crazy. I love it. Tori, this is wonderful because what you have done and what you are doing really is an important message I want to capture here. As an actress, as a musician, producer, a former fashion model, a philanthropist, you've got a lot of things that you're doing. You're still young and you are at the cusp of even doing more. This is very exciting. So I want to kind of capture all of this in your story. Let's go back to the beginning. Now, you're a young kid. Your dad is you know, touring globally with Billy Joel. Your mom is is an astute business person who is extremely frugal in how she runs her business. What was it like growing up and where did your interest start to kind of bring you into the entertainment field? My house was never quiet. We can say that. <laughs> there was always some loud noise going on, whether it was dad playing drums or playing loud music. It's funny because it's one of those things you wish you appreciated more now as an adult, but as a kid, like he'd come running into the room like, Tor, Tor, you gotta come listen to this song. I'd be like, go away, dad. <laughs> and now I'm like, dad, tell me more about it. It was fun, you know, growing up on tour with dad, that was actually where I saw the violin for the first time. It was on the Stormfront tour. It was the only tour that Billy had a violinist. Yeah. Uh, it was a woman named Mindy, and I was just like completely enamored with her, and I just watched her play all the time. And at the end of the tour, I was six years old, I asked my parents, you know, can I play? And then I started playing after that, and that was my first kind of introduction, I think, into the entertainment world myself was violin. And I took it very seriously, and I, I played and practiced all the time through tears and frustrations and kept it up. And then I think that I first got the acting bug, even though I didn't know it when I was seven, when I went to see Les Mis for the first time, I was so obsessed with that play. I wanted to be Eponine so badly. Unfortunately, I do not have a Broadway voice, but I just would sing and sing and I would perform that part to the point my mom made a whole costume, an Eponine costume for me, handmade. My dad, I would make him play Marius and I would die in his arms like every night. And so I swear that's when I first got the acting. <laughs> so you're in this household that is just entertainment haven. I mean, there's so much going on. And I know Liberty's life was always in and out and traveling and, and just the great people that not only did he play with Billy Joel, but there were many other great artists that Liberty has played with and continues to do so. So you're around this here. So violin, were you taking violin lessons at that time? Were there any teachers that were going on? I was. I, when I was six, I started with Suzuki and I played uh, Suzuki. I took Suzuki lessons until I graduated high school. I did play uh, eventually in the Florida Symphony Youth Orchestra, but I think that's why I didn't choose to make violin my profession. I didn't feel like I was good enough to be like a soloist, but I, I knew I didn't want to play in an orchestra. Uh, to be honest with you, it kind of hurt my back sitting up straight like that all the time. Even when I was a kid, I was like, this is very uncomfortable. Um, and I loved playing, but I was like, what, is that, what does that mean for me? So that's why I think I didn't go in the musical direction. But yeah, I, I grew up playing Suzuki Method, which I love. So you're 15 and you started to have you know, a modeling career that, that began doing some commercials. How did that all come about? When I was about 14, 15, my mom had reached out to Chrissy Brinkley, who was married to Billy Joel at the time. And my mom had talked about me getting into modeling potentially. And she introduced me to Ford models in New York. And they were like, well, she's a little short for the New York market, but she'd be great for Miami or Chicago or somewhere like that. And so I got into working with them and I, I knew modeling wasn't like what I like to do. I was like, this is very strange. You know, the culture is very strange. Like, I'm not so sure how I feel about this. Also, I wasn't very tall. You know, I loved eating a lot of food. Like I didn't have that stick figure. And I was like, huh. But a photographer had told my mom she thought I was very shy in front of the camera and that she should put me into an acting class to open me up. And so once I stepped into the acting class, I was like, oh, this is what I want to be doing. This is great. What was the first acting, you know, it was, I think it was a Warner Brothers drama series, Safe Harbor. Was that your first role? Yes. I had done, you know, commercial work and, and things like that. And Safe Harbor was a show that was on the WB 
which is now the CW. And they were filming a show in Jacksonville and I got a part on it and I had one line and I'll never forget. I was walking, I was playing a high school student and the lead character was supposed to be this kind of nerdy guy. And I was walking down the hallway and he drops his glasses and I step on them by accident. And I remember the camera like panned up my leg and I went, Oh, sorry, buddy. And I walked away. And that was my one line. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to be in front of cameras and to be under that kind of, to a certain degree, pressure? How did you feel with all that? I remember being so nervous, you know, when you start the day and you're going to hair and makeup and they're the first people you meet and you're doing wardrobe and there's such a long wait until you actually get on set that the anticipation sometimes can really be a killer if you're not used to it because it's like you think you show up on set and you get to film and it's like no you have hours before you get to actually perform so i remember being very very anxious but my mom was there with me i was like i think 14 15 years old or something so so then what followed was nickelodeon that was the no one knows best did that was that next that was another like very tiny um, part that I had. Everything I did in Florida was very, you know, in high school was very like commercial or, you know, just one line here or there. So I didn't really start digging into bigger roles until I moved to LA. So this was kind of like, like, like a training period for you then. You were kind of being trained for what was about to come. I was. And even though I had great training in Florida and I'm so grateful for it, I still showed up to LA like a doe. <laughs> like when they say she's green, I was green. I did not know because nobody, you know, there's only so far I think you can go in certain areas. And I didn't know as an actor, like really how to build a character and how to really dig in deep with my emotions. And luckily when I was 17, I had flown out to LA with my mom to meet just a ton of managers. I ended up meeting this one manager that I absolutely loved and I'm actually still with him today. We're coming up to our 19th year together. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to this acting coach, Michael Wilson, when I um, first moved to LA. Finally, when I was 18, that's when I, I went out and moved there. I always say, Day, to this day, I do not think I would be a steady working actor if it wasn't for him because he took everything I thought I knew about acting and flipped it upside down and really taught me how to access all my emotions and just really dig in deep. And I was like, oh my gosh, I did not even know that this was acting like this is acting. And after working with him, I booked my first series as a series regular and, and then I just kind of continued working. Thank God. So it's been a journey. <laughs> Fantastic. But now before before this, you had done some performance with the violin. So tell me about the, the you know, Tommy Davidson. He's an actor. He put a band together or, or at, at the Sunset Room. How did that all come about? So when I first moved to L.A., I was living in Woodland Hills because it was cheaper than living in Hollywood. And I was working at this cafe called Tangerine Cafe. And the owner was this woman named Alana St. John and her ex-husband, his name was Christopher St. John and he was on a soap opera for like 30 years. So he knew a lot of people. And so when she opened this cafe, all of his friends would come in and it was like Tommy Davidson and Raphael Sadiq and even Stevie Wonder came in once. They knew I was a new actress trying to make it in Hollywood. So he and her, she, they would both introduce me to their friends. And Tommy Davidson came in all the time because he lived right down the street. And we got to talking and he found out I played violin. And he was like, oh, yeah, I want to hear you play. He's like, you know, I'm doing this show and I want it to be comedy and music. He's like, do you want to play a song? And I was like well, what kind of song? He's like, well, you know, I was thinking you could play this jazz song by this violinist, Noel Pointer. And I was like, okay, I'd never heard of him before. So I listened to the song. I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a great opportunity. And I had nobody helping me. So I had to transcribe it myself. And he had Brian McKnight was playing that night. So his band learned the song and they backed me up during it. And he had a stylist style me in these clothes. And it was so fancy. And my mom came out to see it. And I performed and it was just like, I remember being so nervous, so nervous, but it went so well. Now you get sucked back into violin again. And then you went on and um, Raphael Sadiq's 2004 album, Ray Ray. Yes. What, did you, what happened with that? 
So that was another guy. I met um, Raphael uh, through the same people and through Tommy Davidson. Um, Raphael had seen me, I think, play at the Sunset Room. And we actually became friends. It was so funny because he's a little bit older than me, but he was just such a great mentor. He had so many good little nuggets of advice and, and this and that. So we just we became friends and he was doing his album and he called me up one day and he's like, hey, I've got this violin part. I want to come. Do you want to come into the studio and just play it? And I was like, okay. And what I learned really quickly about playing in the studio is if you're not practicing daily, like it's it's kind of like when you sing in the shower, you think, oh, that sounded really good. But in the studio, you have to be like perfect. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it has to be perfect. And I like, so there's a difference between playing at home and playing in the studio. So I was, again, so nervous, but it was a lot of fun. So you did this and now that led, to, how did the Stevie Nicks, you know, uh, in your dreams, how did that come about? Stevie is a family friend. She's best friends with my mom and she calls herself my fairy godmother. She was doing her album and one of my best friends from childhood, Donald, uh, he committed suicide and passed away. And when I found out, my mom fortunately was actually in LA visiting Stevie and she was staying at Stevie's house. So I went over there and I stayed at her house while I was grieving. And, and she was so sweet. Her and my mom kept trying to cheer me up in different ways. And Stevie even had um, this baton that she has had since high school because she used to do the baton in high school. And she came in and tried to do like a little skit to cheer me up. And and then we sat down and she was like, listen, there's this song Moonlight. And she started writing Moonlight in the 70s. She had just never put it on an album yet. And she said, I'm doing this song and I wrote this this violin part. And I want you to play it and I want it to be a dedication to you and your friend. And I was like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. So I went and I played and actually, this is another thing. So I show up and you know, I'm not playing every day because I'm acting all the time. So I don't have time to play every day. And I show up and there's all these like Grammy award winning producers working on this and, and they're staring at me through the booth. And I get so nervous that I said to them, I go, can you give me a minute? And I walk outside and I call my dad and I was like, dad, my hands are shaking and I'm sweating. I can't do this. Like, because also I think Stevie had written it herself on the piano and she doesn't really play piano. Like she makes music on piano, but she doesn't play piano and she doesn't play violin. So there were some notes that were too deep for the violin to go. And I was trying to figure it out and I was so nervous. And he was, I was like, have you ever felt this way before? I asked my dad, I was like, please. And he was like, yes. <laughs> absolutely and I was like okay so this is normal like it's okay and he was like it's okay just go back in there you got this you can do it and I was like oh, okay <laughs> so <laughs> I did it but I was that was that was the most nervous because it wasn't just Stevie it was like every producer working on her album and whoo they're used to working with you know the top of the top and <laughs> I was like here's little old me like coming in so that was it was great though but what, what great advice from Liberty. And I had the chance to observe Liberty in recording with Billy Joel. I went to several of the sessions. Oh, okay. And just to see the, the magic that happens in there and the spontaneity of sometimes change, change this and do this here. It is intense because those mics are on, they are alive and they capture everything. So that was another great experience for you to have. It's funny, I feel like that's what I've learned most, you know, getting to, especially now as my career keeps moving, I get to work with more and more like seasoned actors and seeing that they still get nervous or that, you know, even my dad's been in situations, even at the top of his career, that has still made him nervous. It makes me go like, oh, okay, well, that never goes away then. You know what I mean? Like, okay, that makes me, because sometimes you get so nervous that you think like, should I even be doing this? Like, is this even a path I should be on? Should I be in another career? And then when you hear something from somebody who's done so much, like, no, 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 you're fine. This is normal. Push through. You got this. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, you're balancing this, this acting career with this music career. And listen, this is not easy to, to balance all of that together in the process of keeping those skills at a high level and acting an equal skill that has to be maintained and worked on for sure. How does it work in the, in the acting field? I mean, probably similar to what happens in the music field. Do people recommend you? You know, are, are there directors that hear you? How does that work on to go to the next gig? 
It is sort of not as much, I don't think, as the music industry does. But if you're up for a big part, producers do definitely call your last producers. And I think it's more to see like behaviorally too. you know, how does this person show up? And auditioning is such a skill. And being on set is a totally different skill. And there is, you know, there are a lot of actors who will kill it in an audition room and cannot bring it on set and vice versa. A lot of actors, it's like being a good test taker and, or not. It doesn't really signify whether you're intelligent or not. It's just, it's a skill. So yeah, people will call and kind of ask around about you or if you've made a really good impression on someone, they will call casting and be like, hey, I've worked with this person before. Can you bring them in? So, yeah, but I don't think as much as in the music. Well, it's interesting how, how it, it works out. So you've got to maintain that level of skill base in acting. Are there exercises you do? Are there classes that you take? How do you keep that up? I haven't taken a class in a long time. I think it would be a lot of fun. It's almost more intimidating now because... I feel like the more and more you grow your name in the field, if you go into a class, it's like people are always almost like, well, let's see what you got. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that level of expectation, you're like, no. So I almost think that it would be really good for me right now after getting off Chicago Med to like go into a class and have that kind of pressure. Because when you're on a show for six years, you don't experience those nerves going to set anymore. And I do think as an artist, it's important to do things that make you nervous or else we kind of like tend to flatline a little bit when it becomes a little too easy, you know? So I feel really lucky. I was actually thinking about this today. Um, I was talking to a friend and, you know, I was like, I feel like in 19 years that I've been doing this, I feel like I've only gone six months where I took off and, and didn't work. And so I've really been fortunate up until Chicago Med. I feel like I really built my career on really cool, interesting recurrings on shows. You know, I did Pretty Little Liars for seven years. I came in and out of that show. I did One Tree Hill for two seasons. I did Vampire Diaries for a little bit and popped in and out of other ones and did some independent films that I loved. And so I felt like I got really lucky to be able to bounce from job to job because when you're recurring, you're you don't have a, you're not contracted to one thing. So even if I'm doing a 12 episode arc on something, they don't have a contract with me. So I can literally the next day go and do a really cool guest star on something else. But when you're a series regular, you can't really do much right. unless it's on your two months you have off, and maybe you could fit a little film in here or there. But so I feel really blessed to have been able to do. Try, like put so many different hats on before doing Chicago Med for six years. What was it like in Chicago Med, which we absolutely enjoyed in our family home. My wife and I just love watching you there. And just and you know, you were just so real in, in you 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 sucked us into the role, which is which is which is an amazing skill where it's not like you're not acting, you were the doctor in that role. We were like just amazed at it all. What's it like now? Because the team that you're working with kind of like a band. You're with them all the time. It's like a family atmosphere, right? Totally. But I always joke because, I mean, acting is a very solitary job, right? We're very transient and we're always by ourselves. And yes, you sign on to these shows and I came to Chicago and I have, you know, it, our show was big. We had nine series regulars. So there's eight other people and you bond and you go out to dinner. But the difference between being on a show and being in a band is when you're on a show, it's like you're in a band where everyone wants to be the lead singer. Nobody wants to be anything but the lead singer. So, so it's, you know what I mean? So it's not really that same like team band mentality. It's like, oh wait, uh, are you, what, you know what I mean? Everybody's like, wants that, that center of attention. So with Chicago Med, I was so fortunate. We had such a beautiful cast. I mean, everybody got along, which, really is kind of rare. I haven't experienced that before. There was no egos, beautiful people, and, and really talented people that I feel like I learned so much from. So I feel really lucky. Well, it's interesting because then you got involved in, in some producing where you got involved with the, uh, it was a psychological thriller, the hoaxing. How, how'd you get involved with that and then involved in even the producing part of it? So that was, you know, really interesting. My my manager, um, like I said, I met him when I was 17. And what I love about my manager and why I think we work so well together is he's always thought outside the box for me. I kind of always like 
wanted to produce, but I don't, I didn't know how to get into it. And my manager was like, I think it's important for you to start doing that. So when I got the offer to do this short film, he kind of said, well, she'll, she'll only do it if you, if you make her a producer as well. So he really pushed for that and he got me into that. And since then I've done that in other areas as well and started to do it more. And it's something that I'm building and want to do more and more and more. And it's interesting because it gives you a different perspective. You know what I mean? Like I had a lot of say in who they cast as my, um, as the male lead opposite me and being a part of that process, I think is, is really cool. And it's also eye opening as an actor because the one thing I learned from being on the other side and seeing all these auditions from guys that were auditioning for the role was that, yes, a lot of it has to do with talent. Like you come in and you're amazing, but it was down to like three guys and every audition I saw, they were all equally as good, but energetically who they were, they just showed up with something different. And, and the one that got the role it just his vibe that he had nothing to do with, it's just who he is, happened to fit the role better. Mm. And so it really taught me that like, sometimes even when you think you do a great job, like sometimes it's just energy wise, you, you can't control over what people want for this specific role, you know? And I'm sure even with drumming and music, it's the same thing. You show up with a different style. Like I, I was shocked when my parents met, um, on Stevie Nicks' solo tour, dad played on her solo tour live um, when he was on hiatus with Billy. And I remember when I first heard that when I was a kid, I was like, how did that work? Like, she's <laughs> like mystical, witchy, hippie. And my dad is like this New York, Brooklyn <laughs> drummer. I was like, that is like oil and water. And dad goes, yeah, that's why I didn't go on another tour with her. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, you really did that. That was the universe putting you and my mom together to meet. And that was it because I don't understand. But that's a vibe thing, right? You can't change that. My dad's not going to be Mick Fleetwood all of a sudden and like start playing very like hippie. Like it's just, it doesn't work that way. So it's the same with acting, which I didn't realize until I saw it from the other side. But it's funny when you say the other side, the producing side really kind of takes you away from the performance aspect and you've got to now step back it's almost like you're looking down with it down from it for like thirty thousand feet and now you got to find out what are the ingredients that we need to pull this off and make this work yeah totally i had this idea once um for a converse ad and i just went out of my way on my break i was like you know what i'm just going to produce it and do it myself and i wasn't in it or anything i hired a ballerina to do this whole spec that i created and it's fun putting all those pieces together. You know what I mean? It definitely is a different part of your brain than acting for sure. Um, and it's, it's hard. It's something that's like, I, luckily I didn't have to get into any of the, the money side of this stuff yet, because that I think is not something I ever want to do, but putting those pieces together and having a say on like, Ooh, creatively, I think that person works, or I think that outfit works, or I think, you know, it should look this way. Or when we're cutting it together, it's like, no, I kind of saw it like this. Can we try to cut it like that? It's, it's, it is a different side of the brain, but I kind of like that, you know? Well, it's interesting how the experience of being behind the camera and in front of the camera, they're like different personality qualities, which you carry it very well. You understand how to turn it on and shift it. And that's a skill that just comes with time. And, you know, you've got that at a, at relatively a very young age, which is amazing. Yeah. You have to know how to turn it off and shift it for sure. I think that that was actually something that my acting coach taught me because especially when you're acting, you're taking on so many different personalities and emotions and you have to go places that you wouldn't normally go. And he was like, when they yell cut, and the scene is over, you have to let it go. Because if you take that home, that's when, you know, you can get into, I think, like addiction and things that you're trying to numb because you're pulling up all this stuff. And if you're not releasing it at the end, it's like, oof, it's like really heavy to have to carry through the rest of your day. Well, and through the rest of your day, and some people carry it through the rest of their life. So it's something which really has to be understood and thought about. But that's a really great you know, formula that you have put together. And I think the balance of your mom's frugalness and business skills 
and your dad's outwardly performing insanity of how he is all the time. And he's, he's one of the funniest guys I know, too. So, I mean, you throw all of that together. You really have got this great combination that you're delivering. What I'm also impressed with is your level of philanthropy, that you get involved in situations that you want to help out. This is a whole nother side of Tori DeVito. Just talk a little about that. It's funny. Whenever I've gotten like deterred by the business or really frustrated, I remember the things that really are important to me. And I remember that the more and more I grow my my craft and my business and my name, the more and more I can help shine light on the things that really matter to me. And that really keeps me going sometimes. Currently, I do hospice work and I do stuff with, with rescue animals. I'm on the board of directors of this amazing organization called Safe Bay, which teaches kids about um, sexual consent and assault. And I, I love it because that, that stuff, like being able to actually go and meet these kids, like I don't like just putting something on Instagram and like sending out a tweet or something. Like right. these things that I do, like the hospice, I get to actually volunteer. I do inpatient care. So I get... Uh, assigned a patient and I'm with them until they pass on and and with Safe Bay I get to go to these schools and actually do breakout sessions and talk to these kids 101 but it all kind of started actually kind of fortuitously it like you know I always feel like when things are meant to be they do find you and I was um I was probably I think I was like 22 I was doing this show One Tree Hill and I was so excited because I feel like I was finally doing a show that people were actually going to see. And I was like, just so happy to be there. But when I was there, there were a lot of egos on that set. Mm -hmm. And it was very uncomfortable for me. And I remember feeling really depressed. And I was like, why am I depressed? I'm like, literally have my dream job on top of it. I was playing this psychotic character. So I was getting to have a lot of fun. And I was like, but I just don't, love the people I'm surrounded with right now. And I'm on stage in reconditioned air all the time. And I really thrive like in nature and stuff. So if I don't get that, I start going like a little down. And I was like, maybe I should find something to volunteer, like get out of my own head. So I thought to myself like, oh, I'll go volunteer at like a children's hospital or something. And I went to research it and hospice popped up. And I actually didn't even know what hospice was. And so I clicked on it and I saw that the hospice closest to me was doing a training that weekend and I called them and I went to the training and I just fell in love with it. And it was funny because everybody around me, my parents, my, my friends, my siblings, they were like, but you're already kind of down. Like, isn't hospice work going to make you a little more depressed? And I was like, actually the opposite. It reminds you like every person I sat with, they didn't want to talk about what job they had or how much money they had. They wanted to talk about who they loved, who they regretted that they didn't tell that they loved enough, where they traveled to and family. And it just reminds you of like, what is important? You know what I mean? It just, it felt like such a life and it light. And it also felt like I was a part of another birthing process. Like you're helping someone birth into whatever's next. So yeah. I just fell in love with it. And then through that and through acting, I got involved with the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. It's kind of like the mothership of all hospices in America. And they have never had a spokesperson before. So I started speaking at all their conferences and raising awareness about hospice volunteering. And I think every time I'd go to a conference, I was like the youngest person by at least 20, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so much fun and I love it. And I still do it. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, I haven't been able to volunteer in person, but, but I just, I, I love it. Well, that's so beautiful that you do that kind of work and that you have that level of deep compassion to want to still step out of your life to a certain degree and step into other people's lives to lift them and give them the most powerful sense, which is hope, which is exactly what you're doing. Beautiful. So in this process now, if you're balancing all this, you know, you're helping people, you've got the acting thing going on, you've got the music thing going on. What motivates you? What drives you to make you want to do all of this? And what keeps you going every day? I love doing what I'm doing. I have so much fun doing it. And especially now, you know, I'm entering into a new phase of my career where I'm obviously older than I was when I started med. And fortunately, roles 
for women, you know, in their forties and plus are getting so much richer in this day and age. I remember when I first started the industry, it was like, Oh gosh, when you're 40, you better hop on the CW and become a mom or you're kind of dead. And now it's just no, not that way. And there's so many interesting roles and like, that excites me now being off that. I'm like, oh my God, there's so many interesting mini series out there. And with streaming and all these different platforms, there's just so much good content coming out. And I get so excited thinking about that, thinking about being a part of projects that I really want to be a part of. You know what I mean? I just um, got off. I did this independent film that will come out this Halloween in the fall. And I got to play this Unitarian Universalist minister. And I got to do these amazing sermons. And it was like, I just had so much fun. It, it was just, that kind of stuff just lights me up. Like when I get to learn about something different because it's a role that I'm playing and I get to play around with it and I get to go on set and do really good material. Like that stuff, like I get so excited for. Um, and I just get motivated every day. Like I said, the more and more work I do, the more and more I can shed light on things that really matter to me. You know what I mean? So um, just building that. And, you know, I, I bought this farm in Michigan and I want to create like this dog retirement community. And I feel like maybe that could be a show one day. You know what I mean? I can use my acting work to kind of bring awareness to that and do that. There's just a lot of ideas that I have in my, in my head. And I don't know, it just excites me. Well, I know for sure a kind of show like that, my wife who fosters dogs, she would love to watch that. So for sure, there are many people out there that are involved in being able to see what can happen. That would be very, very exciting. Yeah. Now, you've signed with this new agency recently? I, I just actually signed with the new agency today, like a couple <laughs> hours ago. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, tell me about Skelly, this, uh, which I believe is a, is will be have a full released. Yes, that's the one I was just talking about. And I play a mom to a 14 and an 11 year old, which was the first time for me too. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Um, but it's this great film. Um, it's got this guy, John Palladino, who played my husband and Brian Cox plays the grandfather in it, who's an amazing actor. So, and the material is just so good. And it, is a really great coming of age story about this 11 year old kid and his friends who do this annual Halloween haunted house. And he's watching his father grieve the loss of his father. And he's kind of grappling with his concept of mortality and grief while doing this haunted house. And, you know, I play this universalist Unitarian minister and, He's listening to those sermons and learning from his parents. And it's this really great family film and just like a coming of age film, really. So I think it'll be really good. I'm really excited about it. You know, in, in this balance of what we do for the artist series, it's about understanding not only the artistic career of what we do, but it's how do we understand the business side to maintain all this? How do we keep this going? What skills are there needed to keep this all going? How do you balance all of this with running the business of Tori DeVito? You know, that's that's funny you ask that because when I first started acting, I feel like I started right at the, um, I was at the end of an era, really, because when I first started, you didn't have to be anything other than an actor. And you still don't, but the concept of like, well, what are you going to create? Like, you have to do something, you have to add to this. That wasn't that way. There was no social media, nothing like that. It was just, you want to be an actor, you be an actor. You want to be this, you be that. And now as I started, it started changing a lot. And it's like, it almost became this thing of like, well, what else do you do? Are you producing? Do you want to direct? Like, are you building content on social media? Are you this and that? And so I think what's really smart is finding things that you love. And like, for me, I love reading. So I'm always reading and checking with my manager to see if rights are available for certain books, to see if I can produce that and turn that into a film. You know what I mean? So finding little things that are also hobby-like things that you can do and connect to your craft. So it's like, yeah, I love reading and I'm sitting there reading a book, but I'm also thinking in my head like, oh, could this be a film? Is this an idea? You know what I mean? Like doing it that way. You know, I was just on med for six years and it's such stability. 
and now I am literally unemployed. I think people don't understand that about our industry. They think like, oh, you're an actress, so you have a career. It's like, no, I'm actually unemployed right now, and I don't know when my next job will be. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's there's no stability. So being smart with your money and being frugal and not getting yourself into debt and just because you get, let's say, a million-dollar paycheck this year, don't go out and buy a huge house and a Range Rover because you might not have that next year. And then you may have to sell that Range Rover and your house and you might be in serious trouble. You know what I mean? So I think just being smart with everything and, and, and really like just not overextending yourself, you know, is important. Well, that really sounds like your mom's advice. Yeah, totally. <laughs> my mom told me from the time I was young, I remember I got my first credit card when I was 16 because I was working. And she said, whatever you do, pay your credit card off every month, every month. She's like, because once you don't, with interest, you'll start getting in debt and it becomes really hard to catch up. And I took that advice and I've never not paid, no matter, you know, even when I first moved to LA and I think I had like $200 in my bank account, I was working like three jobs. I still paid my credit card off every single month. You know, my mom grew up really poor and no money and she really taught herself all that business side to kind of contribute to what my dad was doing. And I think that's really powerful. It really is. And your mom is just a wonderful spirit too. She's just, just an, an absolutely wonderful person. So you came from some incredible roots of, of personalities combined together. You have built this machine that you are still continuing to build and you are enthusiastic, you are passionate. You have all these qualities for a long-term career to whatever level you want to have. In closing, what kind of advice would you give to this young next generation that has the desire to be involved in all these different areas, whether it's music or whether it's acting or whatever part of, of life they can get into? What would you kind of tell them? It's so funny because I feel like sometimes, you know, my dad's even done this where he's called me and been like, hey, uh, one of my friends' daughters wants to get into acting. Would you mind talking to her and, you know, giving her some tips? I feel like when somebody sees a working musician or a working actor, they think that we have some secret ingredient that they just don't know yet. And that is so false. There is no trick. I think the biggest advice I could ever give is work ethic. I've seen it with so many friends throughout my 20s. The ones that we'd all get auditions, you know, and then the ones that would go, yeah, I'll just work on it tomorrow before I go, but I still want to go to the birthday party tonight. And the ones that would go, hey, you might not want to be my friend anymore. I can't come to your party tonight. I've got a big audition tomorrow. Yeah. Those are the ones that are still working and the ones that just wanted to go to the party and put the work, you know, aside and would try to pull it together last minute. They're not working. Yeah. And that to me, like work ethic is everything. Of course, there's anyone that is a great example of serious work ethic. You have put the time into it. You have worked hard for it. And you have earned every degree of success that you have because you literally have worked hard for all of it. And you continue, Tori. This is so fantastic. You know, as we do this with this message to this next generation, as they watch these interviews, it's so great that we have had you as a guest to come by share what you're doing as a part of your life. I want you to be safe, be healthy, be successful. I look forward to seeing you in person. I hope you stay well. And thank you so much for your time from the Artist Series. You too. This was so much fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye, dear. Now I'm Fabio here at the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.